Okay, so uh, hello, I'm Lee Fisher, um, and I'm here to talk about firmware, mostly UFI. So the, uh, can everybody see this in the back? Okay. So the, um, the goal is to talk about, uh, reintroduce some technology for folks that aren't aware of it, a little bit on UFI, uh, and then a tiny bit on SMM, ACPI, and PCI. And talking a little bit about some existing threats, and some, and then talk about some tools that exist today, open source tools that you can use to, um, to help um, detect some of these issues, and then um, take some existing guidance that's fairly abstract and apply those tools to it so you can have an idea of what to do today. And again, we're scoping this mostly to Intel 64-bit UEFI systems. Uh, UFI, a lot of the UFI stuff will apply to 32-bit Intel and ARM 32 and 64 as well, but for the, for the uh, purpose of the talk, we're constraining it to Intel. And there's some more uh, technology and tools that we really don't have time for, unfortunately. Like, for example, we were talking about Intel management engine tools earlier. Um, um, I'll get to that in the end. So um, this is like the one graphic that I drew, so I apologize. Um, we're going to be spending time talking about this blue stuff in the middle, mostly uh, UEFI, a little bit on SMM, and um, <coughs> ACPI and PCI. And obviously the CPU talks to the CPU. So in general, when people say embedded, right, they, they look at their, uh, they say, oh, this is firmware. Everything in this is firmware, right, because it's on an embedded device or a mobile device. So, you know, my application software is an embedded device. My operating system software is all embedded. Um, I don't really use that definition here. I, I look at it more of um, uh, just the system and peripheral firmware. So mostly in this case, we're talking about UEFI and uh, ACPI and then to a degree PCI. USB is interesting too, but I'm not covering it here because there's relationships here with um, PCI and UFI. Um, this is a re really arbitrary distinction here between systems management software and system firmware. Or firmware. I, I do that, it's arbitrary. There's a lot of interoperability there. Um, but the point though is that usually everything in here is just considered BIOS and there's not much else. There's a lot, a lot of stuff in here and we're not considering this to be embedded software. And so uh, in that last chart that you saw a lot of different um, areas here, it, this firmware can be simple with a single user and a single process and a single CPU. Um, it gets more complex when there's multiple CPUs like uh, racks on a blade, multiple operating systems, uh, dual booting, network booting, and it gets even worse when you've got multiple systems under a single service processor so that hardware is in charge of the other hardware. Concurrent <coughs> operating systems like uh, AMI DUOS, which runs um, Windows and Linux, or Windows and another operating system, simultaneously. So it's using kind of virtualization technology to page between operating systems. Um, and then probably the most complex thing is out-of-band management, when you've got um, things like IPMI and Redfish and ILO and um, Intel AMT, which will let you remotely talk to a machine that's on the network, even if the machine's powered off, right? So um, that's pretty interesting, pretty uh, uh, scary stuff to take advantage of. Where like, or for example, in the, in the recent scenario, Intel AMT, uh, they had password problems. So any you, you can log in remotely to a box with any user account and no password. So that's a case where you really need to have that out of band management network locked down well. So uh, in the early days of the Intel processor, there were rings, ring zero through three. Usually, ring zero was for the kernel. Ring three was for the apps, user space, kernel, kernel space, user space. People really didn't use rings one and two that much. And that was kind of the model for security for the Intel. All the interesting stuff, uh, kernel, drivers, hardware, firmware, it's pretty much in ring zero. And that, that's too much for one ring. And so they've really boiled things down into multiple. These are logical things. You, you, there's no in Intel instructions for this. This is just uh, security researcher stuff. But um, so these are kind of breaking down the rings of security into more granularity to understand the stuff below the operating system, so firmware and hypervisors. So we're going to be spending most of our time here, uh, maybe like one slide there. <coughs> and this is the one slide. So this is the ring negative two, systems <coughs> management mode. Has anybody heard of systems management mode? Okay, a few people. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to look up. Uh, generally, your processor is running in real mode or protect mode, and it's just a regular processor. If you switch into systems management mode, it's a whole other processing mode, and um, it can see everything it, that's going on, but y regular apps can't see anything in systems management mode. So it's it's a, a one-way mirror where if you if you get malware in systems management mode, it's almost invisible. So it's a really a, a powerful place for malware to want to hide. And um, 
So yeah, um, systems management mode is, is definitely a place to be taking a look at in, in, in terms of vulnerabilities. Um, so that's negative two, the rest is mostly negative three. Um, various kinds of firmware out there. In the early days, it was just BIOS. Um, everybody know what BIOS is? Okay, so BIOS was fairly straightforward. Uh, you called interrupts, you put in new cards, the new, new cards would hook the interrupts, add extra functionality right, with option ROMs. Um, and there's one open source one called CBIOS, but the rest are closed source. Um, today, most Linux OEMs still use the closed source version because um, the, you still don't have full power of the system if you start using ones that aren't closed source because of NDA issues and stuff like that. So for UEFI, uh, Apple started uh, using it when they switched from PowerPC. Microsoft started using it when they required um, secure boot. Um, you know, core boot and U-boot, uh, often in, in Linux communities, they can also embed BIOS or UEFI payloads. So on, a, on an ARM box, you don't need to load BIOS, but on an Intel box, you, you can. So that's how some uh, core, uh, Chrome boxes work. Uh, so you'll see UEFI even though you're using core boot or U-boot in, in some scenarios. And on Linux, the UEFI stack has got a few extra things. You know, uh, UEFI where um, um, bootloaders like Grub and Refine, uh, the Linux stub which, uh, built into the Linux kernel is UEFI aware or BIOS aware at the same time. And there's the shim itself which lets, which lets you chain load things like Grub and the Linux kernel um, and get signed by people who don't like GPL licenses and still <laughs> deal with that stuff. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read rodsbooks.com, it's a great uh, site um, for understanding how to use all these bootloaders in Linux. Um, so we're going to spend a few more slides here talking about UEFI technology. I'm kind of hoping people know the basics on it. I'm not going to be giving a complete overview of it. don't have enough time for that. But very briefly, UEFI is a bootloader. It's got the complexity of a whole new operating system. It loads up like an operating system at the end. It can act like a bootloader and load another operating system, or it could stay there and run the, run the UEFI shell and run Python apps, and it's pretty much like DOS, except it's 64-bit. So it's got a loader and its own stuff here. It's got um, boot services and runtime services we'll see in the next slide. And uh, usually firmware is baked into the, into the, in the flash, but with UEFI, you can have um, files on a, on a file system. So uh, on modern Linux and, and Windows boxes, there's the EFI system partition, the ESP. It's a fat partition on your boot drive, and uh, that's where extra files can go. So on a Windows box, you'd have a foo.exe file. Here you'll have a foo.efi file for EFI. And so you'll have stuff burned in your firmware, and you'll have stuff on the file, on your file system as well. And uh, the stuff burned in the firmware, it's, kind of, it's, it's like an, a file system, but it's like a big zip of, with a bunch of executables together. And um, EFI uses the Windows PE executable format with a slight variation. So instead of portable executables, there's terse executables. Um, so they're slightly different. They, they use the same tool chain for development purposes, and at the end, they tweak it to, to make it better for firmware. But basically, at the end of the day, your, your system firmware has many, many dozens and, or hundreds of these things together. It's kind of like a zip of, 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 um, of images. Yes, question? For each of the firmware file sections, don't they use UIDs? Yeah, so, so GU, GUIDs and UIDs are everywhere. Um, so, and you will see, we'll see a screenshot of that later. Almost every module in UAFI has a GUID or an ID to identify it. And, and, and there's lots of UIDs in the system to, to see soon. So, um, like, some people still are, are get concerned when they hear that UFI runs in the background because that's something new. It's not something new. It's something that BIOS did, right? BIOS offered uh, boot, uh, interrupt 10, interrupt 13 in the background so the operating system could use them for disk and video and other things like that. In the same way, UFI has boot time services for the UFI drivers that are initializing the thing. And once that's loaded, then runtime services is for operating systems and, uh, to, to take it to use them as well. And so there's a, a variety of things it uses. It, it offers services for uh, variables, time, memory, a bunch of things. It abstracts it, basically. Um, and here's, here's a picture. When you load up a UEFI app, you get a pointer to this one structure here. It has pointers to everything else. Here's your boot services table. This is also kind of a boot services. And over here on the right, uh, the, the uh, purple stuff, those are runtime services. These are only available when you start the system, and these are available after you start the system, like so that Linux or Windows kernel could be calling those forever. Um, and um, secure boot is a, is a feature of UEFI that uh, it doesn't have to be there. It's a, it's a compile time option. And it, it basically uses crypto to help 
um, secure the boot process. It's very similar. Oh, next slide, I'll cover that. Uh, there's about there's a, a bunch of PKI used to do that. Um, for security purposes, the DVX file is one of the more interesting ones. That's the blacklist file. That's the list of bad keys. So um, kind of like in your browser, if your DigiNotar key, you, know, you want to get rid of that root key. Here's, that's the, the blacklist key for, for firmware. And you go to UEFI.org and there's an updated version of that. So secure boot is one way to secure the boot process. There's other ways. Um, t trustworthy computing measure boot uses TPM. Intel TXT version is called trusted boot. Core boot and U-boot have something called verify boot. It's very, very similar. It's a bunch of crypto, different keys to, to whitelist and blacklist the, the system. Those improve security and they also make it more difficult for you to reinstall like Linux on a, on a, on a Windows box for, for, or, or a Chrome box, or, for example. But you know, security configurability, it's a, it's a dangerous thing. So we saw UEFI runtime services. One of the most um, common ones is variables. They're similar to environment variables and key value pair, <coughs> but there's also a GUID. There's a bunch of other flags for it. So it's, it's, a, it's a lightweight database. You could almost consider it somewhat like a registry in Windows, whatever. But um, there's many things here, there's many variables, and they, they, they're used to, for the boot process, to point to all the files to load, and the load order, and um, also to deal with all that PKI stuff for the secure boot. Here's some of the variables that it uses. You can see most of them are talking about the boot order and pointing to the keys for, for UFI. Um, these are interesting, if an attacker changes these variables, uh, it could totally change the way the system worked or the, the keys. So it's useful to understand you if I has, has variables, they point to things, those things have to be verified. The last screen were, were um, variables used for the boot process. Uh, UFI also has a shell, which is very similar to bash or command XE. Uh, it has similar, uh, those, those variables are more used for a user scenario in a shell. Um, so there's a few of those there in case you're using the Python shell or the UFI shell. So that was it just for a very brief introduction to, to UFI, and we're going to cover um, some of the threats on it later. But now we're going to switch briefly to some of those other technologies. PCI, everyone know what PCI cards are? OK. So these days, you get a uh, modern peripheral. You attach you know, like Thunderbolt adapters, Thunderbolt, and NVMe, non-volatile memory. They're all PCI-based. So these days, you, you know, attach anything fancy to your, your laptop. Often, it has got a PCI card inside it. So it's got all the functionality of that. So it's quite powerful. And PCI cards and can hook into and enhance the firmware by adding extra drivers. In the old days, a card would hook the BIOS and add ex hook the interrupts that it's added features for and add it. These days, with PCI you, or with UEFI, you have UEFI drivers, and those are loaded um, um, in a, in, in a, <coughs> similar to the option ROM concept. And so PCI is well integrated with UEFI. And so <coughs> you'll, you'll have a system firmware image on the system. And then for every PCI card, you'll have um, PCI drivers for that EFI um, system as well. And it, it's worse, it, there's, what, there's usually a driver of 32-bit, 64-bit, ARM32, ARM64, and Intel UFI has a bytecode, which ARM now supports, and, and there's also the Itanium one. So there's about seven different targets, seven different binaries per card is kind of expensive, so that's why they try to use the UFI bytecode. But, you know, in terms of security, UFI bytecode is a whole other area, and no one's really um, looking at that as well. Question. So I'm curious, how does, how does uh, it register with UFI? Does it just memory map, and then UFI looks in that memory area first? It's, 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 it's way too complex to get into here. I'll get it to you afterwards. There's a handoff. Uh, there's like two drivers. There's a PEI module that does its handoff with these handoff blocks to um, um, a, a Dixie driver, and, and there's okay, more here. So I'll get, I'll get it to you afterwards. It's, it's fairly complex. So PCI, it's, 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 you need to understand it because it adds features to the system firmware. ACPI is a, ACPI is the evolution of the, all the plug and play and power management stuff that was added as an add-on to like BIOS and it was needed when people started wanting to suspend and resume their operating systems, which is highly unnatural. And um, <laughs> so ACPI is the evolution of all these things. It adds a whole bunch of security areas. <coughs> ACPI has its own bytecode. It's abstract. It's got the machine language. Uh, Linus hates it. Um, it, it is a place where dynamic stuff can happen in modern systems, for example. Uh, you'll, you'll have, a, you'll have um, multiple tables, um, multiple ACPI tables, multiple different registers. It's a whole other subsystem. And um, dynamic Google there, on, on mo modern Windows systems, you'll find ACPI, ta ACPI tables that have Windows executables in them to automatically uh, uh, sysprep a system or to restore it, right? Um, 
pro, you know, a Linux System76 should probably be doing something similar with our systems, right? But um, um, so the complexity here with ACPI gets very OS dependent, right? It gets so you know you have a modern Windows system, it gets you uninstall <coughs> Windows, put Linux on there, while well, there's still Windows in the ACPI tables, and there's no Linux there. But it, complexity there. So there's many, many different tables. You'll find them. Almost all of them are four-letter acronyms. You'll see them later. And if, they're, if four letters is too long, it'll be an underscore and then three letters. Um, so that's what you'll see later. But there's many different tables with specs. All right, so that was it for the uh, just quick introduction to the technology. Now, why, why attack it? I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? It's, it's the new place to go for, for, for system malware. Um, and uh, you can, if you hide yourself there, then you can potentially um, persist reboots. And most of your tools are only looking at OS level and app level attacks, and so they, these are invisible. So it's great if you attack, if you get to, uh, and you know, like 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 Intel AMT or some of these out of band things, you can work while the system's powered off, right? Um, so there's all kinds of uh, ability to do here. Um, so so the next few slides are trying to cover some actual tech, uh, attacks that are happening today. So the the most common thing is an evil maid attack. Right? You leave your ho you leave your laptop at in in the hotel overnight, or you leave it there. You go out and you come back later, and um, you know the CIA used their sonic screwdriver to attack your old Mac Mac uh, EFI box in 30 seconds. Right. Uh, so you know this basically evil maid attack is when you lose lose contact with your hardware and someone else has messed with it. Right. Uh, in the old days, that used to be the key to the server room, but now these days laptops are uh, are an issue. So. So evil made attacks are, are, are a scary thing if you lose control of your system. Um, these days, with 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 uh, things like Windows Update, uh, Windows Update will update firmware now. So if you have uh, if you get uh, if you're an attacker, get root privileges or administrator privileges in a Windows box, you could instigate firmware updates. Potentially, inst you know, if you have assigned proper firmware update capsule, you could. You know, Use that root privileges in that box to install your your firmware on the system. So the co the convenience of the ability to do uh, firmware updates from a user mode app now means that attackers can take advantage of that that convenience. Um, so one of the bigger uh, areas that could be uh, abused is the uh, DBX file that I was mentioning, the um, the blacklist file for UEFI keys. Um, most Linux distros, except for Fedora, as far as I know, don't check that. So Debian doesn't check it, Ubuntu doesn't check it, et cetera. So you can have a system with old keys, kind of like having a browser with Dijonotar key, right? You couldn't trust any of the stuff that happened after that. Well, you could have bad keys in here, and if you have secure, uh, signed modules, right, your signed code is relying on a bad key, then all, all bets are off. So your operating system needs to be able to update your DBX. Does your Linux sister do that? Probably not. Um, Fedora has something called DBX tool. If you have another Linux distro, you should try to see if you can get DBX tool working on it. Um, so that's one thing is bad keys. Um, these are the three. There's a there's a tool called Chipsec. We'll, we'll cover later. It's got a blacklist of known UEFI malware, and they currently have a list of three things: hacking team, um, ThinkPon, and uh, one for the, one of the new CIA ones, one of the old uh, Apple CIA ones. And uh, so we'll cover these two on the slides in a minute. There's derivations from existing proofs of concept. And uh, obviously, the government leaked stuff earlier. NSA, BIOS stuff, and CIA recently did some um, vol uh, WikiLeaks stuff on older Mac EFI stuff. I assume if someone would, were to leak them today, they'd be modern Windows, you, you know, UEFI secure boot ones as well. Um, so the hacking team was the first one. Um, um, so UEFI has support for the FAT file system built into it. The hacking team guys added an NTFS driver to UEFI so that it would be able, their UEFI malware would be able to read a Windows file system and, and grab that data and exfiltrate it. So they added an NTFS file system there. So if you go to WikiLeaks, there's an image. You could, uh, you could look at the tool there. And they put their source code on, on, on GitHub, too, so you can look at the stuff there. Um, Intel ATR has a good blog post that goes through it in and, and, and gory detail. Um, I've got a blog called firmwaresecurity.com. You can search for any of these terms there and find that there, including the blog posts. ThinkPon. Um, I'm not chipset blacklisted, but I'm not sure that it's been seen in the wild. It may be, but it's definitely proof of concept, and um, and um, so you can see the code there and see what it does. I, I saw a tweet from the guy author of this who claims that the chipset blacklist is 100% false positive, but I haven't seen evidence of that. 
Um, one, <coughs> in badly configured systems is, is probably an easier way to uh, get access to a system than, than you know, breaking it. Because right now there's a lot of uh, OEMs that, that are not as configured as others. So some OEMs are better than others. And since we're taping this, I'll have to be careful about that. Um, so external attacks, PCI leach. Go look that up if you've never seen PCI leach before. You can do DMA attacks against against uh, a system. And UFI runs, runtime services are in the in that area of memory that you could attack it. Um, there's some attacks against Linux UFI runtime services with this. You could probably do it against Windows. I haven't seen that. Um, and the same guy had some of the other crashes earlier. Um, proofs of concepts. He's got a nice new device now that's a FP, FPGA based. And he's doing some interesting DMA attacks on boxes right now. So um, that's kind of some of the leading edge attacks on systems. It'll probably find other things later. Uh, for example, like w current versions of Windows, uh, there's features now to disable certain DMA and USB during during boot sequences, right? I don't see that in Linux yet. Okay. Linux needs to catch up a little bit on that. Um, so I'm just talking about UFI, the system firmware and each PCI um, driver to update the system firmware, but that's not the situation. You take you break open a, a motherboard and and you know try to count how many firmwares you can find. There's many of them, and it's not just the main system firmware image. There's many of them. There was a, a, a vulnerability for Dell on-screen display monitors called Monitor Darkly. They they attacked the firmware of some chip on the display, right? So there's many many chips in there, and I I couldn't tell you how many my laptop has. You know I, I doubt that everyone knows all the firmwares on all their systems, and I'm pretty sure that you don't have the ability to analyze all of those blobs as well, right? I, we can help you with some tools to analyze the UFI blobs, but there's many other little blobs in the system that are going to be less uh, auditable. So, um, so yeah, th there's just EFI is one, but there's many, there's many others. And, and I haven't even mentioned this, but USB is a whole other, whole other mess of, uh, um, of drivers and, 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 and firmware issues. Uh, I'm not mentioning it because it's not, it's not well integrated with UFI. UFI is well integrated with PCI, but it's not with USB. So first you do your USB problems, and then you boot into UFI and you have your UFI problems. I'll, I'll cover USB maybe at the next, next Linux Fest. <laughs> um, a few more um, from the same guy that did um, um, ThinkPon. Uh, he's, got, he's really good at um, um, proofs of concept. The good news is firmware is harder to install than, than software, so it's harder to install some of these. Uh, then um, so that's that's the good news. All right, so that was the that was the end on threats. Now we're going to start covering some tools. And we're going to these are basically the tools we're going to cover. These are the big two ones. A little bit on the last three. Any questions so far? I know I've been shoving things down fast, but I don't have much time. Yes. Um, so were the proofs of concepts mainly using the EDK? Because I was just yeah, EDK two, EDK two great. Uh, a couple don't use UFI at all. They attack it through DMA. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So. Um, so, so these are some tools that are open source tools that you can use to help identify some of these firmware problems that we've been talking about. So, quick question, sorry. Yes. So the ones that have already been infected, as you say, disconnecting from the net or throwing up, is throwing out the hardware the only thing? Uh, if you're good, you could reflash your firmware. I, I'm not that good. Um, maybe some, maybe some other people in the room might be. And there's a few people. If, if I think that if you had multiple machines, you probably it's worth your investment to figure out how to how to fix things. But um, like the author of chips, uh, the author of Uf, uh, UFI tool, he definitely could do it. He's got some talks that show you how you could do stuff like that. Um, but it is the problem is you know up, firmware updates are more about something that happens at, by the, band, the device maker, usually not you. So um, it's it's um, if you have problems there, it's it's a lot harder to fix firmware issues than it is operating system issues, right? And so if you're lucky, you can do it. But there's pro there's scenarios where I, I definitely couldn't do it. But, uh, yes. Yeah, SPI stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's, so there's there's multiple low cost options, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper now. Uh, so let's let's try to make it through some of these tools. Um, so firmware test suite FWTS. It's by Canonical, the guys that make Ubuntu. It's most it's not a security tool. It's mostly a defect analysis tool. They're using it to see if the machine the OEM built is good enough to run Ubuntu. If Ubuntu is failing for some reason, this is going to help them. So it's a support issue for for Ubuntu uh, issues. And luckily, it does find some. So this is a defect issue, not really a 
uh, security tool like Chipsec, but it finds many things that are useful. And FWTS is probably uh, the best tool out there for ACPI tests. Um, so it's a command line command line tool. It's got a curses front end, and it's got a live boot distro that automatically boots the curses front end. Um, just to get it started, uh, show tests and um, to run the default test is straightforward. You can run single tests. We'll see in the next slide here. Um, this is the dash dash dump command generates a whole bunch of nice logs to look at, including some binary uh, ACPI ACPI. Hex, I don't like their format. I need to modify that, but they, they've got some nice ACPI tables there. So here's uh, two screenfuls of uh, commands. Notice I said earlier, ACPI tables are usually four-letter ac four letter characters. So most of the four-letter uh, acronyms you see here are tests, a test for a specific ACPI table. So they have many tests for many different things. There's ARM-centric things, Intel-centric things, open power-centric things, UFI-centric things, IPMI-centric things, um, and a bunch of ACPI-centric things. So you use a subset of those for your systems. There's a lot of good stuff here to save and to look at results on. And, um, and here's a screenshot of the Curses UI of the live boot distro. So you, you boot this FWTS live and you can go through it and do this. A portion of the tests are interactive, a portion are batch. There's some really funky interactive ones that you know, involve multi-state, you know, suspend, resume tests and things like that. So there's a bunch of good tests here. If you ever get a laptop, you should check this stuff out first. Um, so Chipsec is a tool by the Intel um, Intel security team. Now they're now they're part of McAfee, and um, it's a tool to test if an OEM's implementation of you know if, if the OEM is built an Intel box in a safe way so that the flash isn't writable, etc. Um, so there's a bunch of tests they have. We'll see on the next slides that do security tests for known vulnerabilities. So these guys will have a talk, they'll go to DEF CON when the security researcher gives a UFI vulnerability and then a few months later or a few weeks later they'll have a new test for that, right? And they'll give talks on how they found that. So, so these guys follow, find existing public vulnerabilities and add, add tests for it. It works on Intel 32 and 64-bit systems with BIOS and UFI. No Itanium support, no ARM support, uh, no other non-Intel support, um, no non-Intel support like AMD or, AM, or clones like that. It's really tied the current code's really tied to Intel for a moment. Um, so, um, and yeah, that's that's where it's on GitHub. It works on, so it's kind of interesting, it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it works natively inside the UEFI shell. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is the UEFI shell has C Python 2.7 uh, ported to UEFI. So, um, Chipsex a Python app, and uh, it works works on Python there. So. Uh, by default, no one ships it. You gotta ship it yourself. Oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, with Chipsec, there's really two main entry points. There's a tool called Chipsec Main and a tool called Chipsec Util, and both of those are kind of high-level wrappers to a suite of tools underneath it, and they both have many different modules. And then you specify the module. And with Chipsec Main, Chipsec Main is the is the security test. It runs a bunch of security tests. You just run Chipsec Main by itself, and it runs all of the relevant security tests and gives you the results. So that's 1A. 1B and 2 are running a specific tool or a specific test or utility, same term to me really, to do a certain thing like dumping an ACPI table or whatever like that. But um, the first one runs many security tests and gives you the results. The latter two you run a particular thing to explore a system individually. Uh, and the way the Chipsec works is they have this uh, hardware abstraction layer for all these low level things they're doing and um, for each of those there's uh, OS helper, which consists of some Python code that sits on top of a Linux driver, a Windows driver, a Mac driver, and then UEFI doesn't have a driver, but it just has extra pieces of code that talks to the UEFI system calls. And so there's a driver that implements these low-level things. There's usually like a, a single instruction or two that has to do its job. And so the chipsec is Python, but there's a kernel driver. It is kind of complex to install, but you go to you go to your Linux box and say sudo pip install chipsec, so the Python Installer code is going to do that. It, what it does is it runs make install and it builds the driver and installs it in your system. So it's a fairly um, large thing. So Chipsec main is the one tool we saw. Chipsec util. They both share a common how, the, and the common drivers. Uh, so um, the drivers have lots of full full access to the system and very little um, protections to to lock it down. So the Chipsec team warns you not to run this on production systems because they don't have. Um, the driver stuff locked down yet, and there's no proper, well, the installers are kind of there. Um, you can run Chipsec without the drivers, 
And in current versions of Chip Tech, it tries to do it without it, um, to do native stuff. There's a few ways. It'll do different things on Linux and Windows. Um, so there's, there's a few ways to get around to run it. So um, tool modules, these are, almost all of these are tests. Um, let's see, most of these are tests. Uh, the one bold there, blacklist, that's a tool that you might run separate. Most of the rest of these are uh, tools that security researchers would run. Um, only a handful here that you'd run as an administrator or a user. Blacklist is one of those in this set. These are, this is the Chipsec main tools. So there's the, oh yeah, right. These are the tests, right? So these are all the tests that it runs. The, the other ones are tools you can run. All, most of the tools you're not gonna run, but you would care about the one called Blacklist. And then in the next slide, um, utilities, there's a bunch of utilities with a bunch of options. You can spend days on this, but the main ones you probably care about are decode, SPI, and UEFI. SPI will let you dump your, saves a copy of your uh, uh, firmware image to a file like rom.bin. And um, so, so you say chipsec util SPI dump rom.bin, it saves your file. Once you've got that, you say chipsec util decode rom.bin and it does analysis of it. And if that's not clear, there's online and offline analysis. You run chipsec on a local machine, it does security tests against the local firmware. You can also save the ROM image, the ROM.bin image. Once you save that ROM.bin ROM image, you can walk off to another machine, you know, a, a, an Amiga, right? It doesn't need to be an Intel machine. And you could conceivably run chipsec without a driver, without the low-level driver stuff, and do offline analysis of that ROM.bin image. So you could look at that on an ARM box, for example. You don't need to be on the same box that you're testing it. So there's offline analysis and live analysis. Um, the slides we're seeing here are live. When you're testing a live system, we've got two slides here. Um, these are some examples of, of what you do to a live box, like dumping the ROM.bin or reading a particular image in memory or dumping UEFI variables <coughs> or reading a particular UEFI variable with that GUID and saving it to that file. So questions, first in the back. It or so so potentially so potentially you could have some really sophisticated malware that could take over the system and, and lie and and say no everything's fine right uh, the test that it makes uh, your malware could be sitting behind that address right there and giving a value that that, that lies to chipsec right yeah. uh, I think the only way around that is um, is is to uh, do something like Intel TXT and look at some of the measurements um, and so potentially if you had like a live boot distro that used Intel TXT and to detect changes, then you could uh, check for that first and say, all right, peers that using Intel TXT, which uses Intel T, which uses TPM and does measurements, given all that measurement foo, I have a, a increased level of, of confidence that, that the system's not been taken over and it's lying to me. That's, that's, but that's a, that's kind of a serious thing. I don't know, most security tools don't do that. So. Yes. Well, this sort of trick was done quite a bit at least uh, ten years, ten years ago, and before with viruses. You had to hook it; the virus would hook into the operating system, then lie about yeah. where it was uh, located. It's it's that that was easier with BIOS. It's going to be less easier with UEFI. It, it could be possible the UEFI has different ways to to secure against that, and um, yeah, th this just reminded me of the yeah. Power. But, but even beyond the current thing, if you, if you had a malware in the system and were totally lying about everything, something like TXT or TPM and looking at the measurements may help, but there's nothing in place right now for that. One sec, we have this question here? Go ahead. Um, you were saying about SPI dump and then doing offline analysis. Yeah. Does it try to host that uh, image in any way or is it just static analysis? Static. Okay, so yeah. yeah. There, there's, yeah, there's other stuff we could do for dynamic analysis, but that's not really in the scope for this. Um, um, yes, sorry, third question. The previous question? Yes. So um, let's finish this. We got live. You use some live examples. You're using a live machine. Uh, here's some examples of some offline analysis. So on the live, so you offline happens after you've done live stuff. So you were in your live box. You saved 
your uh, UFI keys, your, your ROM.bin, and now you're in an offline box, which is, could be the same system or it could be a completely different system, and now you're analyzing the data that you made earlier and, and looking at it. And um, so it could be in the same system, could be in a different system. Um, and um, so decoding ROMs, yeah, so it's looking at files you've seen here. Um, that was ChipSec. Now, two, two slides and two other similar tools. Overlapping functionality. We have, we're going to mention three tools, all of which will read the rom.bin files of, uh, that flash rom or chipsec generates. I forgot to mention flash rom. I mentioned in the abstract, sorry. Flash rom could also be used to generate a, a rom.bin. And uh, so flash rom is nice Linux code, so maybe I'll enjoy that. You could also generate a, a, a rom.bin with chipsec, generate with a flash rom, and diff the two if you don't trust one of those tools. But once you've got your rom.bin, then you can use UEFI firmware parser or the chipsec decode tool to analyze it. And, and the advantage of having two different ones, two different code bases, <coughs> they find different things. So this one's pure, pure Python based, um, FV Python parser there. Yeah, so um, it's, it's very, very strong. There's also one other one here. It's called UEFI tool. Let's see a screenshot on the next slide. It's a third parser. It's written in C++, uh, Qt. And uh, it's got a, um, this is a GUI. Um, and like you're saying, everything's got a GUID. Here's an example, GUID is everywhere. So all those modules we saw earlier, so they search for this GUID, and, and as you see here, it's a Dixie driver. It's called the rootkit loader. That's the hacking team's malware driver right there. Um, and uh, so that's the GUI. It breaks down that, that the volumes into its, all the different pieces, and you can look at it and see what's in there. Or instead of using the GUI, it, uh, there's a command line version as well, and it just dumps it to the command line. So um, UFI tool, UFI dump, command line versus GUI version of it. All right, we're in the last slide for tools. So there's something called um, Love uh, Linux UFI validation. It's a Yocto-based Linux distribution by the Intel, um, Intel Linux team. It's mainly meant so that um, they can give this to Windows OEMs, and Windows OEMs can test their OEM systems to make sure they'll work properly with, with Linux. So, um, but, it, but the good thing is it, it, it bundles firmware test suite, and chipsec, other tests, including BITS, which is Intel's BIOS interface test suite. So if you like BIOS stuff, you'd love that one, uh, and, and a few others. And it runs them, um, runs them all in batch mode and saves the results. So you put this in. If you're, if you're lucky enough, to it works on your system. You wait a few minutes and come and look at the logs. And um, so that's a great way to get uh, some simple testing there, but it's all batch mode. So if you want to do anything more interactive, you need to run, run chipsec directly. A uh, couple slides on this. This is probably not going to use this. Most of these other tools are tools you'd run on a, a Linux command line. You have, so uh, how, how many people have ever gone into the UFI shell? Okay, great. So, so UFI is an operating system. It goes into a shell, looks pretty much like DOS. Um, the UFI shell is kind of like Command XE. And uh, it's got, you know, 80 commands, mostly command, co command console apps, two full, sc full screen apps <laughs> like edit and hex edit. Um, why is it downloading separate UFI shell? Yeah. So usually the shell doesn't ship in your system firmware. You have to add it extra because the vendors usually don't want that. So you, you can get a UFI shell. You can get Python for UFI. You can get chipsec for UFI. You can get ACP dump for UFI. You can, get, uh, you can get UFI firmware parser running in there. So there's a whole bunch of things to do there. It, one thing that's interesting is if you have a suspect Windows or Linux box, it's sometimes nice to be able to go into, into uh, um, something that you know is not compromised and, and run stuff here. So, so the UFI shell is interesting. Usually the UFI shell is not an option in your boot menu. You'll have to uh, add it. And so uh, generally what happens is this, this whole thing is trying to say is um, the way UFI works is when you boot the system, it looks for... Uh, a bootloader, uh, an app to run. Usually, it's a bootloader. And uh, if you if you have a fat formatted uh, thumb drive and there's nothing on there except one UEFI shell file, and you change your boot order so that it boots off that thumb drive first, UEFI is going to say, uh, "All I've got to load is not the Windows bootloader, not the Linux bootloader, but the UEFI shell." So I'm going to load the UEFI shell, and that's how you can get a UEFI shell on, on a box that doesn't have it. Um, there's pre-compiled binaries there, um, and and also pre-compiled binaries inside um, chipsec. And um, there's a certain directory layout, and the file naming convention for different architectures is, is, is presumed. So once you're inside the shell, again, like I just mentioned, it's 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 like a, it's easy to port apps like Netcat or traditional C apps because the um, the EFI dev kit has something called the EFI app dev kit, which has a uh, wrapper to libc. 
for most things. So you can write network apps, socket apps. Um, so um, you can write a lot, put a lot of apps there. It's got about many of them already, many uh, DOS-like apps and a lot of other apps. The UEFI shell is not written for end users to play in the shell in UEFI. It's written by EFI developers to test their code. So most of these commands are more like kernel debugger commands for de de debugging drivers. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do here to diagnose the system. Shell scripts are pretty much like DOS batch files, except there's end if and end for. Um, so um, you can write scripts to do the stuff there. Uh, and uh, uh, the scripts there, there's a startup NSH file. It's kind of like your autoexec.bat on Windows. But instead of being on the root of the drive, it's, it's, in, it's in the shell. It's in multiple directions in your path. So you could potentially, uh, if you're an attacker, you could shove one of these in your path somewhere, and it could do weird things. So you need to take a look for that. You're probably not going to be running a UEFI shell because you're probably not familiar with it. You're probably more familiar with, with Python. So you might want to load UEFI Python's in shell and just stay there. Um, other tools, there's a there's vendor-centric tools. That's the problem because um, they need to be from the vendor, right? Um, some examples of those, um, a couple OEMs have um, diagnostic tools for UEFI, either built in or you can get them from their support site. Uh, Apple's very, the latest version of, of Mac OS, not OS X like it says there, it, there's a tool called EFI Check. It will generate a ROM.bin file like Chipsec. It will do some security tests like Chipsec. It's not Chipsec, but it's a new Apple OS X tool that, that does stuff. Windows doesn't have that. Linux doesn't have that. So Apple's leading the way there. Um, Surface has, has some really cool stuff that I hope Linux catches up to where uh, enterprise only features where you know disables USB ports in, in certain scenarios for evil made attacks, things like that. Um, let's see, you can reset. There's tools for Apple Store to reset things. I guess it phones home. Lenovo and a, a couple others have uh, TPM reset CDs. Um, it really varies by vendor. And so with, you know, usually I, what I mean by vendor is not usually Linux vendors because they're, you know, Google or Apple or Microsoft. So we need better support from, from Linux vendors. All right, so the next, the next batch of slides are, um, are some advice and guides, like the, slide, like the title of the talk said, best practices. Um, I'm, I'm merging two sets of uh, advice, and I'm adding some um, suggestions here. First, there's some really simple si uh, five-step thing here I'll cover in a minute of, of basic ad advice. And then NIST, the uh, government agency with advice, they have three documents on that, and they have a platform lifecycle that you're supposed to follow um, for Secure BIOS. And it's very abstract guidance. It doesn't talk about any tools so uh, or really technologies like UFI. So I'm trying to apply some existing tools that we just covered earlier for UFI's concept into the NIST guidance. So that's kind of the last part of this talk. So the first part from um, the Chipsec team got interviewed on dark reading, and there's a set of five steps here. Know the threat's real, practice basic, you know, Security stuff. It's these are these are nothing really that uh, low level. This is stuff that you should do for most anything. Um, okay, so uh, and I'll cover some more of this in more detail later. Make a golden image. We'll cover that in a little bit too. That's also very good. Uh, I'll cover that in a second. Yep, I'll, I'll be covering these in another slide. Yeah, so think about it. Okay, so that was some generic stuff. Now uh, NIST has three sets of documents, 147, 155, and 147B. And they cover, um, it says BIOS, but it really means, you know, BIOS these days is pretty much a synonym for system firmware. So it means UFI or core boot or U-boot, whatever. Um, so there's three things. 147 basically uh, um, you know, uh, ha introduces the PKI like, like, you, like verified boot or secure boot. Uh, then we want, um, measurements with TPMs to trace things, and 147B uh, extends the definition of a PC to a, a fancier server with uh, rack mounts and blades and, and BMC controllers, so the one, one piece of hardware is in charge of others. So the platform lifecycle, um, when you first get it to when you get rid of it, right? You, you, you provision it, you deploy it, you maintain it, you recover it, and dispose of it. And, uh, and so I added one more here. Before you, before you purchase it, um, you should try to uh, get, if you're, if you're able to, bigger companies can do it, individuals probably can't, get security results back before you buy the box, right? Wouldn't it be nice to know if the machine you're about to buy is, is gonna fail all the chipset tests and it's not gonna be defendable? 
Um, it would be nice to know that in advance. And you know, if I got a box and then I immediately ran Chipsec and found out that it fails, I'd like to be able to return it. I'm not sure that most of us could do that for this, right? If it's got a crash hard drive, you could return it. But if it's got a bad security design, you have to keep it. Um, so um, if you're a big enough vendor, you should ask for that in advance. Say, you know, I, I'm going to buy a bunch of machines from you guys, but you've got to send me some results back. And, and, uh, and but, yeah, so, and you might try returning it if it doesn't work right. right? So, but that's beforehand. You've got you to you gotta ask about this stuff, right? Uh, and then, so this, some of this guidance is, is, is somewhat targeting an enterprise system in so they can set policies. So you need to set policies like all new machines must be UFI, not BIOS, or must have secure boot or verified boot, and must have a TPM, or the TPM must be enabled, or AMT must be disabled. So you have to start setting policies like that. Um, so a little bit about policies, okay, um, and if you're able to, return the box if it's not secure. But the very first thing you, you do when you get it, um, yeah, like I said, if chipsec doesn't work, uh, you're going to have to, you know, it's broken and you're going to have to maintain it forever. Um, so um, I'm going to go roll for this at the end. There's, imagine everything you can do in the boot menu, disable this, enable this, those kind of things. Uh, you know, enable wake on LAN, enable that. All of those are things that she should be setting in her company policy, especially things like today, and maybe disable Intel AMT until things get straightened out. Um, um, yeah, so that's straightforward here. Okay, so um, firmware, yeah, again, these are features that are in the boot menus, um, setting policies for different things here. Okay. Um, when people say this, UEFI defines BIOS as, as compatibility support module. Uh, or legacy boot. So that's when you see CSM, that means that's EFI is calling BIOS. So legacy stuff, you, UFI is more secure than, than BIOS in that regards. However, if you happen to have a system that's got CBIOS, the open source BIOS project, it's got TPM measurements in it. That's really great. I don't know of any vendors that you can get that pre-made from, so you're going to have to put it in your own box. So another uh, do-it-yourself project, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Yeah, don't have extra apps. So the ESP is the EFI system partition. That's that fat-based partition on your boot drive that contains the EFI binaries. Um, so look on that thing to see if you've got CPython or an infected version of CPython or uh, some startup that NSH files that, that load a bunch of weird things that you may not want to have. Uh, if you're able to you know, enumerate all the option ROMs you have in your system, how many PCI cards you have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, so uh, Smash and Dash are similar to uh, Redfish and IPMI. They're D DMTF. Um, Smash is for servers, Dash is for desktops. Uh, okay, so provisioning, secure boot should be enabled. Um, all UFI code should be signed, kind of like on Windows Authenticode. Everything should be signed. And uh, if you're a big company, you can redo the, so usually my, uh, every, a lot of open source People don't like UEFI because Microsoft's the certificate authority, and um, so conspiracy theories can go from there. Uh, these days, and it's ironic too, Microsoft's telling people to not use their key and use another one key because it's got lesser privileges now. So in security reasons, they're even revoking their own key. Um, but you, if you care about, if you're a data center or you're an OEM and you want to, uh, or you're an enterprise and you care about your security such that you want your own keys on there, because if you look at the NIST standards, right, um, there's, that's, that's one of the options. So you could replace all of the signed code with your own, right? And uh, uh, Core OS, the one that Matthew Garrett used to work on, now he's switched over to Google, uh, it's a cloud-based Linux system. They took out all the Microsoft signed keys of UFI and put their own keys in there, right? That works great until you plop in a new PCI card that wasn't signed by them, it's only signed by Microsoft, and then you've got this problem where that card's not signed, it won't load, right? Um, and then your installers have to handle situations like that. Current versions of the Mac, you put in uh, a, a Thunderbolt device, and there are key sequ boot key sequences where the Mac will not load, well, will not touch those things now because it's worried about that. That's, that's not really as much the case in Linux. And there needs to be more in that regard. So if you're really serious about PKI in your own enterprise, you could redo all those keys and mean to be in control of all those keys. And uh, there's a few tutorials on that, and it looks like current versions of VFI are getting better at that. Um, so. Um, Maybe by mid-year that might be an issue. So once you've deployed a system, this is a, the first time you get a box, you need to run chipsec or, 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 a, or flash ROM um, or, or a similar tool and save that ROM.bin, right? Uh, 
just like when people are talking about operating system issues, saving your golden image, well, you know, that's, that's nothing. Operating system issues don't matter at all. Firmware issues are a lot more serious in this regard. And you don't have golden images. I mean, uh, so you need to have a golden image. You need to have a hash. And, um, you know, you need to have that image and, uh, for your laptop. And then once you go through customs and you come back again, you need to have it, check that image again. And, and if it's changed, you might want to throw it away. Or, if, or you might need to learn how to update your firmware, right? Um, uh, so, in the, so, you know, a change in that would detect evil made attacks. That's why you need to make regular updates. That's why you need to make an update the very first time you get your system. And changes will happen every time the firmware updates occur, right? So if you, you have a ROM.bin when you first got your box, and then let's say it's a Windows box, you ran Windows Update, and Windows Update updated your firmware, including UFI. Um, then you, you get a, a dump your ROM.bin again, it's going to differ, right? And the difference is going to be the firmware updates that happen. And those are legitimate updates, right? They're not attacks. But do you know about them? Did, did your vendor tell you about them? It'd be nice if you had some kind of change log or read me. If not, you really can't tell where those changes were. And so using some of those other tools we saw earlier to parse things, it's helpful because you can diff the module names and understand what's going on. And if you had the slightest read me of, of what features have been changed in your system, you might correlate them to, to the module names, right? Um, if you don't have any idea of what's being changed by the vendor, you're up, you know, you've got to handle it yourself. But you've got to save a golden image. Does that make sense? You have to save it at the beginning, you have to maintain, you have to track it. You should ask the vendor for their golden image, or at least a hash of their golden image. Uh, I know of one that saves them, but I don't know of any that gives them out. So uh, if you're a big enough vendor, maybe you could get that. Uh, if everyone starts asking, maybe eventually some of them will start doing that. Um, but so you have to have a copy of that and um, track it over time. Uh, once. Yeah, so Windows Windows Update now will handle um, firmware updates. There's something called FWEPD firmware update for Linux. Yeah, it's GNOME centric, so uh, KDE people have to have to address this. Um, and right now, I think the main vendor that supports that is Dell. So um, good for Dell. If uh, if you have a Linux vendor that's not Dell, you should maybe ask them to support FWEP update um, because you know one of the key features for any security thing is. Uh, apply patches, and if you don't have a way to apply your firmware patches, you're out of luck. And with Windows, it's straightforward. With Linux, you have uh, one option if your stuff supports it. So um, you've got to do your firmware updates. You've also got to rerun your tests, like rerun your offline analysis tests of Chipsec. Save your ROM.bin, and then every few weeks or whenever Chipsec adds new tests or updates their tests, new blacklist entries, you rerun that and it will possibly find new issues with your old ROM.bin because new tests have been added, right? Um, another thing that I didn't mention here, Chipsec just added a whole new command called whitelist. They've got um, a handful of images of vendors firmware and they're, it's the opposite of their blacklist thing. They're, uh, they're creating a list of those and they say, all right, I think these are good, so we'll call them a whitelist. And now if you see those, it'll compare those values on your system. If, you're, if those values differ from your system, then you have to wonder if it really is the same or if something else happened. But uh, there's only a few of those. You could generate your own whitelist if you had them and compare them against them. Anyway, you have to, you have to rerun them occasionally to look for, to look for changes. One, one form of change would be a security event, like an evil made attack. That's a bad thing. Another change would be a firmware update from a vendor. and That's a good thing, but you have to know the difference. If the vendor doesn't give you a readme, you don't know. Right? So, um, and so mostly I've been talking about <coughs> UEFI here. UFI images. There's also ACPI tables, a bunch of those things. Some of those things contain executables, right? Does that Windows SysPrac executable actually do the right thing, or is it a malware that does something evil? Um, UFI variables are key things. We saw we can dump all the variables. Uh, those variables point to the PKI used to secure it. So you know, if, if those are wrong, then things go down. So you, you can be saving all your variables. You can be saving your tables. You can be diffing those. If you run FWTS, it bundles a thing called ACPI, ACPI dump and uh, with some related tools, and they will dump, uh, dump the tables that unassemble the ACPI machine language, bytecode. Um, so that's good. Uh, again, monitoring. Uh, out of band management means that um, things can happen when the system powered off. Usually it's been over Ethernet, but recently uh, there's at least one vendor that's got a Wi Fi implementation of Redfish. So, I can attack their box 24-7, uh, even if they're not plugged in, because the Wi-Fi is connected, right? So other vendors may have that. Um, but um, so for all these remote management things, um, IPMI, whatever, 
you should really isolate those machines in a lab and, and try to, because uh, you don't know what's going on. You need to sniff them very well. As, as Wi-Fi as well. On UFI, it's got a complete net stack. DNS, DHCP, FTP, TFTP, IPsec, um, uh, Pixie boot, UFI, HTTP boot, uh, chap authentication, uh, IP, sec, IP version 4, IP version 6, iSCSI with that weird DNS-like, you know, namespace thing there. So there's a whole lot of network stuff in there to, to uh, pay attention to. Uh, once, you're, uh, once you've had a problem, then um, you should try to re regenerate your image if you can. Higher end systems, usually business class machines, especially servers, often have tools built in that let them let enable you to do that. Others don't have built in tools and they don't provide images, so you'll have to use tools like ChipSec and FlashROM to create the images. And if you're good enough, use tools like ChipSec and UFI Dump, UFI Extract, and UFI Patch to extract things and build your own thing and shove it back. Um, if you're, you know, so that's, <coughs> you have to be careful on this. Okay, I've, I've, I'm not, that, I've, oh yeah, so, um, let's see, what else am I forgetting here? Yeah, uh, comparing your images, same results, right, right. Um, so once you've, once you've, uh, once you're done with the system, you need to reset it. These days, since there's, you know, UEFI has user identity concepts, with IPsec and, 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 and Pixie Boot and UEFI HTTP Boot and, and uh, CHAP, somewhere in there, there's going to be some IDs, credentials in there. You may not want to give that to a competitor or an attacker. So you should try to reset your system. I guess the best way is to hopefully have a, uh, a you know, factory reset option in the firmware menu if that's there. If the vendor's given you a ROM image and the tools to reset them, maybe you want to take a ROM image, a golden ROM image there and reset the system, right? Uh, Back to the earlier concept of tools, right? Lenovo has CD that will reset the TPMs, others won't. Um, so you've got to find the right tools for that. Again, bus um, business class machines usually have better tools for this. Uh, consumer class machines usually don't. So uh, you might find some additional tools. In terms of all the things I've been mentioning here, Linux Foundation, um, so one guy at the Linux Foundation created some pol IT policies for laptops that was there and includes some firmware stuff. And then a few months later, they uh, came out with an ebook that, uh, that a little bit more um, um, verbose on that. Um, the uh, Vincent Zimmer, one of the guys of Intel UFI team, at, uh, a few months ago at the UFI Plug Fest mentioned, uh, these slides will be on the, online on, on the LF Linux Fest website. Uh, give me it's like tomorrow. I'll put them up there. Uh, so the uh, UFI forum and or Intel, I forget who, is working on a set of enterprise, enterprise deploy, deployment guidance advice. So probably a better version of what I've just been saying. Um, they promised that a few months ago. It hasn't happened yet, so at least I beat them. But when their stuff comes out, I'm sure it'll be better than mine, so read that. Uh, Matthew, um, this is one document where he gives a good description of some Linux issues and, and Secure Boot. Um, but again, it's kind of piecemeal. We've been covering a bunch of small little things. There's not one great book right now. Um, company is, um, I'll go to the beginning here. Uh, oh, this way, this will do it, right? Ah. So I've got a blog here, and almost done. Uh, blog is called firmwaresecurity.com. There we go, firmwaresecurity.com, that's my personal blog. Um, that's probably, unfortunately, one of the better sources of data for, for uh, firmware security. I guess it's lame, it's just my blog. But uh, there you go. Uh, I'm doing a, a startup here on, that's focusing on, on firmware security, and uh, we'll be having some more stuff there. We've got an alpha for a product. We have an alpha product, by the way, that, that runs most of these tools, automates them, makes it easier for sysadmins to look at the results and reports and, and things like that. But we're also, uh, I have a couple white papers coming out, including one in this guidance, which will be better than what I've just said um, in, in, a, in a PDF kind of white paper um, in the next month. So probably three weeks. So in about three weeks, look here. And uh, look on Linux Fest Northwest, uh, the, the page for this talk. Give me about two days. I'll put the slides online. And uh, there's usually uh, every, every couple posts a day on firmware security on, on the latest uh, news. It's not much. It's right? generally an Earl or two at a description. Yes? Uh, one question is set to more, if it's more enterprise class machines, they have better tools, better security, et cetera. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think I think. Uh, well, 
Um, well, the Fink Pond issue had impacted, I think, many. It was mostly consumer level devices. Yeah. That I, I, so the ex exploit. So 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 there's two things. One is one is uh, machines that get infected. That's fine. <laughs> um, that's one issue. But the issue about tools. There's there's really two. There's so so. Um, in the old days with BIOS, you would have uh, an OEM and a hardware vendor, and then there usually be a BIOS vendor, an IBV like Phoenix or AMI, and they would make the BIOS and they'd bundle it, right? These days, if you buy a consumer class machine from an OEM, that's probably how it goes. They, the OEM went to someone like Phoenix or AMI and got in, or inside and got their uh, third, you know, BIOS and, and used it. But for business class machines, uh, the same OEM would probably make their own firmware. For their for their uh, for their machines, and that's where they would be adding extra tools. So, one concept is is like ThinkPon and attacks. Yeah, ThinkPon might have attacked a, a ThinkPad. Um, that's one thing. But um, the ThinkPad ThinkPad is an example of a business class machine that probably has some better um, tools than you would have on 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 consumer class machines. So it's separate things. It's having good tools from a vendor to restore and fix your things. That's separate than also. Um, the issue of, of which machines are getting attacked, right? Business class machines will also get attacked as well, but but business class machines have tools where consumer machines, consumer class machines usually don't. So if you want to reset your stuff uh, with a consumer class machine, your best bet's probably to use ChipSec and uh, learn how to use that well. But if you have like a, a, one of the better OEM machines, the server machines, there's probably something in your boot menu that helps you with this, and they probably even have maybe even have an uh, image that you can download from their site and to reset it. So the tools are welcome in that regards. And then the difference is, in the old days with BIOS, there was like, you know, there was one and then they kind of was a cloning business. With UEFI now, there is the open source project called Tiana Core, which contains the open source, the BSD licensed open source version of UEFI. And anyone can use that. So all the OEM, all the vendors are sharing that code. But that's just half of it. Then there's the the vendor centric code, all the all the o, the drivers that are unique to that OEM and IHV. So they bundle that together. So a business class OEM now just takes the drivers they need for their business class hardware, and the open source project builds it together. They don't have to outsource it because they care a bit more about it. Yes. About uh, how does one buy the business class uh, with a bigger bigger checkbook? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, uh, in your experience. Uh, Doing security analysis of how much percent have been infected with the Marla virus. I'll tell you once we're stopped recording. <laughs> 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 no, no, I mean, I, there's a spectrum of vendors, right? You know that. Some of them are good, some of them aren't. And, and, and firmware issues, for example, go, uh, go look at that same talk I mentioned, uh, pointed to earlier about Vincent Zimmer for the Plugfest. There's his slides. It shows that, you know, as soon as the vulnerability hits, all the OEMs know about it, the fast ones fix it immediately. And the slow ones are going to be really slow to fix it. And if the fast ones fix it immediately and ship a patch, then security researchers could look at that patch and figure out what the thing was and go attack the slow system. So there's this there's this window where yeah, it's a mess, right? So um, yeah, it's, you need to do a little bit of homework and hopefully get the better end of the, of the machines you want. Um, yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll talk. We can talk later. Uh, any other questions? I, I think I did finish my thing. Yeah, so again, um, LinuxFestNorthwest.com, I'll have these, these slides on, on the, uh, the, the talk page. And uh, I'll put an announcement on the firmersecurity.com uh, blog. And uh, look on this site. Um, give me about three weeks. I'll have uh, some uh, white paper with this guidance in better shape. So. <laughs> and, the bad bias, and the bad bias stickers are over there.